Hey, this is Kate Gunning, and you're watching and listening to The CMO Show with Kate Gunning. My guest today is a marketing shaman. That's what I named him. He's Chris Ahrens. He's a professor of marketing at UT. Watch and listen and enjoy. Good morning, if it's morning where you're watching or listening, it's Kate, and we're on set at the CMO Show with Kate Gunning, that's me, and I'm really pumped about my guest today. He's Chris Ahrens. He's a professor of marketing at UT, but prior to that, he was an agency dude, and he started a social media function before Twitter even existed, so... We're going to get into all of that and how he maybe predicts future, so to speak, on our show today. Hey, Chris. Hi, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for joining. Delighted to be here. Awesome to have you. I don't think I've sat down with a professor other than when I was in school. So We're <laughs> this, not that is, bad. this is a very exciting slash scary moment for me. I'm like, please don't, please don't judge my or grade my performance today. No, 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 no. <laughs> Uh, that's that's the bad professors who do that. Uh, <laughs> you've got to learn. It's got to be a safe space to grow. Otherwise, you're not going to learn anything. Yeah, that's so. true. Well, marketing professors are the best professors. I believe that to be true. I yes. for sure think I that. don't have hard data, but let's go with that. <laughs> We're going to just go with the gut yeah. on that one then. Tell me, how did you get into being a professor? Uh, well, for almost 20 years now, I've been doing one-day classes for entrepreneurs in the city of Austin, and it's Every day I had one of those, it was the best day, teaching them social media, marketing, branding, whatever. And it's just really excited to know that you're helping somebody who's mm -hmm. doing something, frankly, that I'm in awe with building a business, Yes. but helping them grow their business. And um, I'd had various agency jobs, some in-house corporate jobs, and uh, had a, a, an epiphany moment with my wife. And she says, you know, you've got to do something that you really love. Mm -hmm. And she said, what do you really love? And I said, I love teaching. And she said, go do that. Just yeah. go do that. And um, as luck would have it, in 2019, uh, the University of Texas had a wonderful digital marketing professor, but he decided to take a corporate job, and they had 32 days to fill the position. Wow. Uh, my dad always <laughs> said, it's better to be lucky than good. <laughs> right um, place, right time. That's it. And I just <laughs> I had written a best-selling book on digital transformation. Mm. And um, I had an interview at three o'clock. It lasted three hours. They wow. said, would you do a syllabus? I did the syllabus that night in another two hours. The next morning I was hired. They gave me one class because they didn't know if I'd work out, you know, to be honest, because academia, everything's a year in advance. Yes. And then I had to wait another semester until I got two classes. And now I teach four or five classes, almost all digital marketing or principles of marketing. I love it. Okay. So what's your book called? Uh, the Digital Helix. The Digital Helix. Yeah. Can we find it on Amazon? You can. Okay, perfect. Let's yeah. link that in the yeah in the chat or whatever it yes. is, it's, Where, it, wherever it is that we link things. <laughs> it's a little dated because it was done pre-pandemic, and yeah. it was basically a rallying cry to digitally transform your organization. Yes. But the model and a lot of the thinking, and it works, but some of the stories are no longer mm -hmm. kind of COVID-esque, yeah. so... That's kind of interesting, actually. Go back in history and review and per a pre-COVID perspective, post-COVID. I think uh, that, that sounds like a very interesting exercise. Well, I'm seeing it. I mean, yeah. I think you're probably, we're all seeing it. Yes. Um, my students are different this semester than they were pre-COVID. I'm sure. Consumers are different this, sem uh, this year than they were pre-COVID. So, you know, the world has fundamentally changed, um, sometimes for good, sometimes not for good. Yeah. Um, but marketers who don't understand that the psychology of the buyer is a lot more anxious than it's ever been and a lot more unsettled, I think, you know, are not going to do very well. Is that the biggest difference that you've observed? We're just fundamentally different people. I think, I don't know if it's a DNA level change, but it's something close to that, that people yeah, no just... longer interact. They no longer function the way they, I, I often say that, you know, people are feral right now. Um, I'll give you a prime example. I was driving on Mopac here in Austin mm -hmm. and there's an on-ramp that I take to get off or get on uh, Mopac, which is one of our freeways, as you probably know. And it's a 500 yard long entrance ramp. And somebody decided she didn't want to go on the freeway. So she put her car in stop on a single lane road and backed up 250, 300 yards. Whoa. Like 
who does that? Like yeah. the state should step in and just take the car away from her That's at this very point. Dangerous. Huh? But that was perfectly acceptable behavior mm-hmm. post pandemic. I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. I'm just going to extricate myself. Right. Interesting. And how do you think that psychology impacts brand building, marketing itself? Right. Cause like, it's a good question. Consumerism's totally yeah. changed. So we need more trust. Like mm-hmm. I'm less trusting, you're less trusting. And patient. <laughs> yeah, no patience. Backing up, sorry, bye. Yeah, yeah. And I don't care what you think. Yeah, like yeah. people are honking, giving her the middle finger, and she's just waving. Like it has no impact on her. Like yeah. I'm doing what I need to do. It's all about me. Yeah. And uh, that's really what it's boiled down to is that this constant barrage of buy my product, here's a coupon. People are turned off by that. I mean, um, I'm sure everybody you know, everybody I know, everybody listening, probably could spend the rest of their life on a webinar. Yeah. Like, I get 45 invites. To, I don't have time for all the webinars that are going on, and some of them aren't even that interesting to begin with. So I think we have to work 10 times harder to really understand that, you know, you seem like a very nice person, but you're a narcissistic bastard. You know how I know that? I'm a narcissistic bastard. <laughs> Everybody we know is a narcissist bastard, and we want to talk about what we want to talk about. We want to understand and get into a rhythm of the things that are important to us, and the more brands do that, the more they're going to succeed. Mm-hmm. The less they do it, the less they succeed. But there's a real bent in corporate America to do what they did yesterday, and this is a different world, and that's not going to work anymore. Yes, so how do you modify your curriculum accordingly? Uh, I don't have a textbook. Mm-hmm. Everything is current articles, usually no longer than maybe 12 to 18 months out. Uh, there's constantly new case studies I'm bringing yes. in. Uh, we have projects we do for businesses around the state of Texas. Um, so it's always designed around this one theory that if I was a student, what would I want? Mm-hmm. And I'm going to treat you like an intern, not like a student. So that way you're going to learn in a professional, safe work environment so that when I turn you loose, you're going to show up differently in a job interview. But more importantly, you're going to show up as being an elegant beast in a marketing profession that, frankly, you have to prove yourself to be a marketer before you actually get the title of marketer. Absolutely. So what it sounds like is you're actually training people how to think. Yes. Critical thinking is huge. Right. Intellectual curiosity is huge. It's all of those things that people get hired for that reading a textbook and memorizing and regurgitating. Like there's nobody's ever paid you or I to do cut that. It. Yeah. Nobody's ever paid us to do that. Right. <laughs> I get you through one presentation, but that's about it. That's it. And with, with AI, <laughs> right. with AI now, like I don't even need you to read the textbook. Yes. I can just give you, you know, or give you the article. I can give you somebody else who can pair it, pair yeah. it back in bullet points for you. So Absolutely. we need people who find elegant solutions to complex problems and ask questions and identify issues before they come up because that's the way the world is right now. Yes. Okay. So a class with Chris is like a class, a class in immersion around learning. It sounds like, like this is how to think, this is how to be intuitive. This is how to process. Yeah. um, Psychological. Yeah. And it's, it's, there's, so there's a lot of ambiguity. Yeah. But to counteract that, um, some of the people that I've had come and speak to my class, Roy Sutherland, yeah. uh, Marcus Sheridan, Jay Bear, who are all outstanding. I just love the hell out of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've been so gracious with their time. The uh, people from Chipotle, the people from Wendy's, mm-hmm. um, Kendra Scott's people, uh, they come in and I've kind of collected what I call the digital 15, okay. which is 15 core principles from myself and those other people I mentioned that basically are like your operating system for digital. If you start with these higher level principles, you're going to wind up with a more elegant result because you're not going to dive right into the tactics of it. You're not going to do the pedestrian and you have to really internalize those. And so if you, if I get my students to internalize those 15 or help just print them out or put them (laughs) as a desktop screensaver, they will start at a better place and they'll constantly be reminded that there's, there's elegance and beauty. If I push through the monotony of corporate and of yep. doing the same thing over and over again. Okay, so hit us with your top three. Uh, well, the first one is the most important one. Can you be and how can you show up to be the right brand doing the right things that's worthy of evangelism? Yep. If you do that, and you know, think about every brand you love, H-E-B, mm-hmm. Nike, yep. uh, Richard Rainwater. Cheers. Um, yeah, <laughs> those are the kind of brands that say, hey, listen, we're not here to sell your product. We're here to make le- make your life easier, enrich your life. Mm-hmm. Like, we just had a huge ice storm in Austin. And I asked my students, everybody okay? 
Okay, you're all okay. If there was a problem at your house, your apartment, who has your back? Name a brand that you has you have your back. And everybody said H E B. Yeah. Everybody, because H E B always has our back. Mm -hmm. They had truckloads of water. They opened up when nobody else could open up. Yes. They they are there for us, and that's why they're the fastest growing grocery chain. They are beloved by Texans mm -hmm. the world over. Mm -hmm. And we, we treat them as if they're a monument like the Alamo, right? <laughs> and that's because they are the right brand doing the right things. It's worthy of evangelism, which means you tell people, which extends your marketing, which gives you that free publicity, which is extraordinary. Yes, I agree with that. So what's the most important trait for marketer then? Uh, that's a really good question. What, I, what, what do you give an A plus for? <laughs> intellectual curiosity yeah. and uh, and and thinking through the problem, um, what comes next? Mm -hmm. Like you know, it's it's so easy to come up with a marketing idea. Hell, you can steal marketing ideas. Like, hey, this brand did it. I'll go do it. Yes. But can you say what comes next? Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a prime example. It was just on LinkedIn the other day. Uh, this is from the '80s, but I'm sure you'll appreciate it. Um, I'm an '85 girl, so yeah. Okay, good. But <laughs> but like it's like this is like old school, old school. It's about a pencil. Mm okay. And this school district said. Uh, gave all their students, don't do drugs, pencils. Seems like a good idea, right? Mm -hmm. Horrible. Can I swear? Yeah. Horrible fucking idea. <laughs> the it. dumbest fucking idea <laughs> in the planet because when you sharpen the pencil, what happens? Don't do drugs turns into do, do drugs. drugs. Like <laughs> nobody thought through the process yeah. to figure out if this thing goes well, what is the best possible outcome look like? And are we ready for that? If yes. this thing goes down the toilet, and I mean fast, are we going to set trip wires so we know it's going down the toilet and we have a course correcting strategy already in the hopper, ready yes. to go? Nobody does that or not a lot of people do that. HEB does that. Yeah. Nike does that. Apple does that. But, you know, those are great brands that do things differently. AT&T doesn't do that. No, I would say not, especially not in Austin. Service here is horrid. Well, it's, it's. So, you know, we started out talking about what we're interested in, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and AT&T is a very fine corporate sponsor of the <laughs> University of Texas, and we are deeply yes. appreciative. Thank you, AT&T. Um, but, you know, they're, from a marketing perspective, their catchphrase, their, their one thing they want you to remember mm -hmm. is fast, reliable, and secure. They're not any of those things. Even if they were, that's the bare minimum for cell phone coverage. Yeah. Like if you're not, like if I said, we're slow, sketch, and really wonky. Like <laughs> nobody would buy me. But somehow, but our saying, brand is so lovable. Yeah, but we're fast, reliable. Like that's literally <laughs> yeah. like the car works. Like that's that's that level. And then there's other thing is you know the best deal for all customers. Mm -hmm. We're in a highly. Com do you have a cell phone? I, I have a cell phone. Do you know somebody without a cell phone? I don't think I do. My son, who is seven and thinks he should have a cell phone. Okay, but, he, but that would be. He, he's already down the path. <laughs> he right? already thinks he needs one. Exactly. So <laughs> the only. No job AT&T has is how can I get you to switch to me and all they're telling you is that we'll give you a deal which everybody will give you a deal they yes. won't tell you what the deal is by the way <laughs> most of the time and that we're the bare minimum for coverage mm -hmm. that's what irritates me because they're the phone company absolutely and they've not done something elegant which T-Mobile has done which is why they're growing mm -hmm. so you know those are the things we talk about in classes can we look at an example where somebody has done something extraordinary and impactful yes. to revenue, to growth, to everything. And it starts with understanding what customers really want, talking their language, mm -hmm. being very, very intuitive. And again, leaning into the fact that you're a narcissistic bastard and you want what you want. If I give it to you, you're likely to reward me mm -hmm. with something, a click, a follow, yes. a purchase, whatever it happens to be. Good. So intellectual curiosity, most important trait, how do you nurture that for yourself? Oh my God. Uh, so, um, podcasts mm -hmm. first, um, what's your favorite podcast other than the CMO show with, of course, with me, obviously. of course, I mean, it goes without saying, <laughs> right. Uh, no, I just find wherever they go. So I look at the people that I like, like I'm a, a huge fan of Rory Sutherland, the, um, uh, chief creative officer, chief, whatever he is at Ogilvy UK. Um, it's great what, shop. What? It's a great job. Yeah. And so um, a lot of times I'll just say, what has Rory been on? So if somebody uh, values Rory in his time, I'll look at that. So I think I don't know if I have a favorite podcast. I'm just always looking for topics. Yes. Uh, like this month is like AI month. Hmm. And so, for example, 
Um, last semester, I think I mentioned the word AI twice in a semester, twice to my clients, maybe once. I mean, I mean, give myself credit, probably not even ever. And this semester, we've talked about it almost every day. And so, like, I'm now looking at, like, okay, what is AI going to do for marketing? How is that going to change the state of the art? Should my students be worried about their jobs? How should they be preparing themselves to not only maybe use AI, but maybe get around AI to be more valuable? So that's an example of how I stay intellectually curious, I guess. That's great. All right. So along those lines, in terms of losing jobs, yeah, CMO turnover is a topic that we tend to talk about here. Yeah. And... It's high right now. Yeah. I actually learned a couple of episodes ago that it's not as high as it once was, like maybe 10 to 12 years ago, which well, was really pre- interesting. Right at the beginning of the pandemic, it was it was a bloodbath. Yes. But then everybody realized that everybody's online, so we need a yeah. digital CMO. So then it yes. became, oh, let's send the private jet for the CMO. Yes. And so now I think with the possibility of a recession, mm-hmm. it's back to being a little bit dicey. Yes, it is quite dicey. I'm still waiting on my private jet, by the way. Yeah, me too. I don't know where. When you get yours, call me and I'll call you. That is, we can coordinate. Exactly. So, what? Why do you think it's? Why do you think it is where it is right now? Let's say because it's not higher or lower necessarily. It's just a big topic of conversation. It's marketing's hard. Yes, marketing's super hard, and I estimate, and the people I've talked to estimate, it's between fifteen and twenty percent of people have a uniquely gifted and slightly dysfunctional brain that sets <laughs> themselves up to understand that your best friend can lie to you about why he or she bought a product mm. right in your face. Look you square in the eye and still figure out what how they bought it and do something that makes it so they will want to buy your product or favor your brand or something else. So marketing's just hard. And then marketing is harder because it's a quicksand competition is changing. The rules have changed. Now we have Google Analytics 4 has changed everything, right? So everything's changing. And I think to be a CMO, you just have to be really good, really intuitive, have a little bit of luck, and then... And a demented brain. (laughs) And a demented brain. And then somehow figure out how you can do it, not only on Monday, not on Tuesday, but for years at a time in an industry that's constantly shifting and changing around you. And I think that's why it's hard. It's not that there are not a lot of gifted CMOs out there is that sometimes they're just not in the right situation, mm-hmm. don't have the right tools, budget, whatever team, or the market is just not right for what they're going to try. And mm-hmm. they might crash and burn, but they might be a huge success somewhere else. Yeah. The marketing mismatch is a real thing. Yeah. Or sure. Just like you could have a really boring date with somebody and then be in the same restaurant and have a super awesome one. Yeah. Just like the vibe, the vibe is good. Or but it, your, but it, something your boyfriend wasn't right. or girlfriend could have the, yeah. a date with that exact same person. Yeah. Think they're the most amazing person. Yes. It, there's a lot of situational totally. stuff. And sometimes, yeah. you know, I said it before, my dad always said, it's better to be lucky than good. And I asked him, I said, what the hell does that mean? Dad? He goes, good people don't always get what they want. Yes. Good people don't always get where they want to go, but lucky people always seem to show up at the right time. Like my job. Yes. That wasn't me being good. That was me being lucky and just mm-hmm. s- the world kind of shifting in my direction or me finding yeah. that, that gap at the exact time. And sometimes that's what it comes down to for marketing. I yeah, mean, I agree. I do. And I think that like you're saying with brands, Two of the same brands could build in a similar way and one of them flies. Yeah. Right? Like, and then people are studying it forever, but it's just a case of you're a good brand and you got a little lucky. And there's a recipe, certainly. Or you're at the right place at the right time. Or somebody found something interesting you did and all of a sudden now you're the thing that they remember and they don't remember the other thing. I mean, I used to work with this wonderful, wonderful man we were just talking about the other day. His Mm -hmm. name was Fred Hoare. He was the head of the uh, agency that I uh, ran the LA office in Shandwick. Okay. And he was called an icon in the Valley of Icons in Silicon Valley. He was Apple's first PR guy. Oh, wow. Um, And... Fred often said that the world only has room for one and a half stories. Mm -hmm. And I think in any category, you really only have room for one and a half brands in your brain. Mm -hmm. And once you get that one brain, one brand plus, I think it's really hard for another brand to do something unless the other brand pushes out of favor or does something. And that's part of the problem. That's why Apple wins Mm -hmm. and Samsung never will because they're the one and it just, you know, there'll be people who love Samsung, nothing wrong with Samsung phone, but they're not going to think of them the way Apple has most of us thinking about them. Yes. And 
not every category is really ready for a true challenger too. That's true. I think that's a hard thing to communicate to a client if you are on that side of yeah. it. I One of my favorite stories along those lines mm-hmm. is uh, a boss that I had once at J.P. Morgan. Yeah. She was running the brand efforts for BlackBerry. And she tells this story to me around, well, as soon as we figured out that we weren't competing with the gorgeous quality of a, a, the Apple phone, but the reason people want the BlackBerry is its utility for work yeah it's the bbm messaging right that was like pre-whatsapp that as soon as they really leaned into that then that really helped right yeah. for a time right now we're in a different world this was years and years yeah. ago but it's true i think and but that's where the curiosity comes into play right like you're trying to understand well what's the customer love bbm for they're literally keeping their blackberries because of one piece of it blackberry messenger <laughs> yeah but see, right? but we one of the things we teach in the class in the digital marketing class is this concept of call called jobs to be done mm. and it's a very famous thing from clayton christensen um and basic- yeah, that's a that's a brief that's a a cell yeah in a creative brief when i was first trained on one i'd say yeah what are the jobs to be done um, and so many brands don't think that way. It's like what it, everybody's hiring a brand product or service for an outcome. Yes. And the classic thing, which, you know, is I don't buy a quarter inch drill. I buy a quarter inch hole. Yep. Right. And I always challenge my students. What is the outcome? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to just get thirst from Richard's rainwater. Yes. I could get that from a fountain. I could get that from a hose. I could get that from, you know, Ladybird Lake. I'd probably be sick for a week, but I could still. <laughs> please don't drink from Ladybird Lake. Yeah, if but... you visit Austin, please do not yeah, drink don't do that. Sorry. from Ladybird Lake. D- legal disclaimer. <laughs> um, you're obviously a good marketer because you have the legal disclaimer ready right well, I there. I did work on Wall Street for 10 years, there so I understand the whole disclaimer deal. There you go. Um, so. But that's not what people buy it for. They buy it for a bundle of stuff that Mm -hmm. means something specific to them and they associate a value to it. And a lot of brands don't know what their job to be done is, what that thing is. And it's the simple answer is rarely the best answer. Yes. And the famous one is the milkshake example, Mm. um, which, you know, is people would buy most of the milkshakes sold at McDonald's are sold like 630 in the morning, which is batshit crazy, right? Who in the hell would do that? I saw your face like, oh my God, like like that's that's literally the most insane thing I've ever heard in in a post-pandemic world. Why do people buy milkshakes at 630? Because they're men who have a long drive ahead of them. Oh. And if you think about the jobs to be done theory, what yeah. they do, and he did this by talking to customers. He didn't do it by surveying them. He went into McDonald's with his team and said, watch people come in and said, hey, what are you doing today? Where are you going? How often do you do this? Do you always buy a shake? And he determined that men who have a log drive ahead of them, the McDonald's milkshake solves the problem of breakfast entertainment better than anything else on the planet. It fits in a cup holder. Everything else you eat is messy and it goes in a long time. Yeah, and you can't do it while driving. Can't do it. There's a cup holder. There's literally a cup holder in your car, so it's perfect. And if you've ever tried to drink a milkshake at 630, you will stir and poke it for an hour so it keeps you engaged. 600 calories keeps you filled up. You're not falling asleep at the wheel because you're stirring the milkshake. Well, and you have 68 grams of sugar, which is going to keep you amped up. By 11 a.m., though. And so that's what the milkshake represents. And he said, okay, so what should we call it? And the answer was, let's call it the triple thick shake to remind people of this. And McDonald's is the place that has the best milkshake. So when you want this kind of thing, you should go to us because we're more conveniently located and cheaper than about every other option you have. Mm -hmm. And so if we understand the true, you know, in my heart of heart of hearts motivation for what I do by talking and having real conversations with customers, It's the best part of my day. It's the best part of everything. You learn the secret sauce. You hack their DNA and their brain chemistry, and then you can do elegant marketing. Always. I totally agree with that. And I think that one of the problems with marketing today is that the customer is completely ignored. Yeah. And it's like, oh, we don't want to take time to pause and do research. Or I'm like, this should be an everyday, all day thing. Like, there's no excuse why you can't have some sort of insight about your audience all the time. Because we've got so many tools with which to do so. But there's two things. One, you have to really listen. You and do. you have to be intellectually curious. You yeah. have to say, okay, my God, okay, walk me through this. Help me understand. You did this, but you had all these other choices. I want to burrow into your brain and yeah. live there for 10 <laughs> or 15 minutes. Burrow into that brain. 
and live there for 10 or 15 minutes and then figure out <laughs> what and how you make your buying criteria for my category of product. Yes. But it's so easy to do one plus or yeah. we this worked on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Let's do it on Wednesday or it worked last week. Let's do it this week. And that's what a lot of marketers, I think, get trapped into. And I'm going to just say this right now. It is 100% easy for me to say this because I watch what happens. I see it after it happens or sometimes as it's happening. And I appreciate being on the client side and being an agency that sometimes the situation is not set up for you to be able to do that. You've got to turn that crank at hyper speed and you don't have time or resources or people or whatever to go and do this, but we should all aspire to that. So I don't want to, I don't want people to think that I'm saying, Oh my God, this is simple. And you're an idiot for not doing that. Yeah. It's much more difficult that it takes a real level of discipline to do it. And it takes an, uh, uh, you know, agency within your organization to be able to have the resources. Yeah, agency as a verb. As a verb to be able to do that. And I think that's a big part of it. I agree with you. I often find myself frustrated that there's so much focus put on pumping content out every yep. day, six tweets a day, six TikToks a week. It's like we're just doing marketing rather than if we're spending all that time doing that, why don't we also spend time learning and I think one of the hardest roles to get agreement on in terms of investment, especially if you're trying to prioritize budget, is roles or tech yeah. that just spend time listening, having an ear to the ground. Sure. It's like the first thing that gets cut. So I love this conversation. Well let me say something about what you just said, which is really important. So yeah. first of all, in twenty twenty one there mm-hmm. was eight times more content created than was consumed. Yeah, and so- a lot of it's tone deaf. Almost all of it. It's it's self-serving crap. Buy my product, buy my product. Here's a coupon code. Um, So that proves it. And then I had a client who um, just several months ago, like at the end of the quarter said, hey, I produced 27, I don't know, 2,700 pieces of content last year. Mm -hmm. And he's bragging about it. I'm like, why are you bragging about it? The week before you told me sales have been flat for nine months. So you produced three times more content, but you've generated 0% more growth. Mm -hmm. So you know, those are the kind of things that I would hope that my students would go in and say, hey, stop this. Absolutely. Stop that because it's not generating the kind of stuff you're doing. You're doing activity for activity's sake. And there's a feel good metric or we have a click and our clicks are going up because we've created so much stuff, but it's yes. not doing something for the business. Mm-hmm. That's right. And there's so much time spent on that content production swirl Yeah, that I think could be spent on listening to people yeah. and really trying to understand and unpack. Like if I made one or two pieces of really powerful content that speak to what I'm hearing yeah. from my audience and think of how, how magical that could be. Yeah. And it, then it becomes uh, rewarding, mm-hmm. right? It becomes rewarding for the marketer it becomes rewarding for the team because they see we did something and not only did people get excited about it, but it moved the needle. And I think it almost becomes drug like at that mm-hmm. point. Yes. If you're allowed again to do it and, you know, the shackles have come off and you are freed to do some elegant things or just run controlled experiments, mm-hmm. run a, an experiment where you're going to have 10 pieces of content over the next 10 days and you're going to just put it out there and if let's find our secret sauce and then we'll lean into that. That'll become the DNA for what our great content is and reverse engineer it from all the other brands. But like I said, it's easy for me to say that because that's in a perfect world with all the resources in the world and your CEO not yelling at you, mm-hmm. you know, 24 seven or the board of directors or somebody saying, you know, we got to do this. Yeah. I mean, I think the anxiety that you mentioned consumers have has also created that feeling among marketing teams mm-hmm. and, and leadership teams in general. Like if we're not doing enough activities yeah. then sales will be harmed, right? But when instead, if you took a breath and listened and well, then the, had the, more the, impactful activities. Well, the problem is metrics though, yeah. right? The problem is we have a thousand billion metrics for clicks and fans and followers. They're, they're there. We don't I have won't to, let them on my dashboards. Yeah. Like I don't even care. No, if engagement's not amazing, I don't care. Yeah. I, but but you have those and they're right there. You don't even have yeah. to look for them. Like yeah. they're just there. How many engagements or um, metrics do we have for things that talk about brand lift? Like we can measure it post, yes, but we can't really. So it, it's it's a measurement problem as much as anything. And until you 
you know, experience it, and then you are experienced it once or twice, then That's I think right. it becomes uh, like a yeah. drug or religion. But yes, I agree. Until you do it, it's so easy to fall for the stuff that's in front of you because yeah. at the end of the quarter, if you work at a corporation, you've got to go in there with your little quarterly numbers and say, look, I checked the box. Absolutely. Otherwise, what else are you showing? Right? Like, oh, my gut, my gut promises that this will work. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, okay, yeah. sure. Yeah. The next word is you're unemployed. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Bye. I love the idea that uh, as humans, we can have feelings, anxiety, fear, excitement, empowerment, joy. Similarly, as marketers, like my takeaway, this isn't the word you use, but my takeaway from everything you're teaching me right now is as a marketer, you can almost have a, a feeling inside of your bones that says this will be impactful because it's based on a knowing that I have from my audience, from my curiosity. Yeah. And when I have that feeling in my bones and that knowing, that usually means it will be impactful. Or at least you should try the run or the experiment. Or at least you should run the controlled experiment. Yeah. So try to have a couple of those matches, well, if you will. Let me put something in, in front of that because you're absolutely right. Yeah. But it's if you pay the price to really get to know your best customers, not mm -hmm. treat all customers equally, right. use customer lifetime value and say, these are the best customers. Mm -hmm. I'm going to disproportionately target them. Yes. I'm going to disproportionately market to them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to live, eat, and sleep and breathe with them as much as humanly possible to truly know them. Mm -hmm. That way, when something comes up, you will know it because you know them like your brother, sister, mm -hmm. husband, wife, whatever. Yes. And that's what it takes is this holistic view of it. And that's what the best brands do. I have friends at Chipotle who will tell you that, you know, I don't know if this is going to work, but the TikTok team says this is going to work and they live on TikTok and damn it if it doesn't work. Yep. That's what it takes is somebody who pays the price to be in the conversation, to know you at your core, at your root level and respect you like the wondrous person that you are. Mm -hmm to get to know you and then be able to have a conversation with you and add value to your daily life. So when you, the moment strikes, and this yes. again, why marketing is hard, because you have to get all these chain links together. When the <laughs> moment strikes, you come and say, damn it, Chris, I need what you're selling now. I already trust you. I'd like to buy a whole bunch from you, or I'd like to buy something from you. And then I have to continue the loyalty loop yeah. to get you to come back. Absolutely. That's marketing. It's not easy. Accountants can just add one plus one, right? <laughs> it's it, th there's 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 much more rules in almost every discipline and and then for every rule that we have i can give you you can give me a thousand ways that some brand has broken it and been hugely successful that's why you have to run those controlled experiments because you don't know what you don't know mm -hmm. and if you lean into a pristine world of we've got this you're going to always miss something and then somebody else is going to find it like you know liquid death up until a few years ago, water was boring. Yeah, that's right. No, now Liquid not. Death is not, it is not boring. Sorry to mention a competing I brand. I love Liquid Death. I love rainwater, but yeah. I love Liquid Death's an amazing case study. How, amazing. You know, and it's like, you talk about curiosity, studying that as I've recently joined onto the rainwater team has been even more interesting because now I'm studying them not as a lover of, brands and a student of how you build them but I'm equally identifying them as a competitor now and trying to understand even further the psychology of what they've created it's so magnificent oh it's it's elegant it's beautiful yes. Mike uh, Cesario is deserves an academy he award does. and a he Tony does. award I mean he's, he should, he's an EGOT I mean the guy is a marketing EGOT he's but um, this year I think I read uh, last week that their merch sales are actually going to be a significant portion of revenue. That's yeah. how big his brand is. He's no longer really selling water. Mm -hmm. He's selling this iconic liquid death yeah. thing, which people love. Absolutely. That's that's mind blowing because we always hear people, oh, it's a it's a lifestyle brand and all this stuff. And, th <laughs> and there's some lifestyle brand, but this man has actually turned something that we get for free into a brand that people really want and it resonates with them. And now he's actually selling merch to where it actually has to have a line item on his financial state. That's right. That's huge. Yes, it is huge. It's amazing. Amazing. Okay, so I think I know what your answer is, but I want to ask it anyway. Okay. We always ask what your superpower is. Yes. So tell me how you would articulate 
Your superpower. Okay, so superpower is really important to me, and it's really passionate to me. And um, I just read an article that Mark Cuban wrote about this uh, several months ago. He has the oh. same philosophy, which I didn't know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if Mark Cuban likes it, I like it. It must be good, right? Um, <laughs> Definitely. But I think all of us have a superpower. Mm -hmm. And your superpower is that thing that you do without effort, that your boss and your friends say, oh, my God, how can you do that in five minutes? It would take me 15 hours to do. And I would want to vomit my mouth just a little bit when I'm done. Right? I love this way of describing it. And so that's what it is. And, you know. Your thing that you do without effort. That is seemingly effortless okay. to the rest of the world. Yes. Uh, and, to our, and to you, but it, you're just naturally gifted. Your DNA, your biology just. Yes. You know, I know people who can do accounting and finance like it's. Like they don't need calculators. Like it just happens. Like that would be, oh my God. Like I'd, I'd want to be put in a vice for yeah, an hour. And I'd be like, um, see you horrible. later. See you next lifetime. Yeah, horrible, <laughs> horrible. Like it's like, like that's a seventh circle of hell for me. But then I asked them to do marketing and it's literally like the most painful thing in the world to them. So I think if you think about things like that and if you really listen to what your boss and your friends are telling you about what you're totally gifted at or what you do with, with great ease, maybe not effortless, but with great ease and great success. If you find your job that has that and will pay you for that, you will be happy, you'll be successful, and you'll yes. always have extra time because it didn't take you a long time to do it. <laughs> so, you there's know. There's a nine to five hack if I ever heard there's one. There's a nine to five hack, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know what my superpower is, but marketing comes extraordinarily naturally to me. Mm -hmm. And coming up with themes and taglines because I want to go and spend time with customers. And when they talk, I get just incredibly interested in their stories and how they go about things. And then to be able to share that and teach it, those somewhere in there is my superpower mm -hmm. because it takes no effort. Every time I have a thought about doing it, I'm excited to do it because mm -hmm. it feels good and it's natural. And I want to learn more about it because I feel enriched by doing it and it makes it more more less effortless. I, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Less effort, <laughs> le equally or more effortlessly for me. So I think it would be something in that because it, that's what really gets me excited to get up and I will do it. You know, if I have eight hours, I'll do it seven. Yeah. May I offer a suggestion about sure. what I think it is? Yeah, sure. I, that's, that's a good part of having friends <laughs> yeah. to point out things that you might be myopic to. That's Excellent. totally right. I think you're a guide. I'm a guide. Oh. You're a guide. Because you, what you've explained here is you pick up patterns, you assess things, you learn, you're very curious, and then you help people organize that information so you're to good. help nudge them along. Yeah. yeah well, and I if I think about it, you know, I, 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 I'm not even going to dispute it or say there's anything. Because <laughs> uh, if I think about I'm going to be calling you, Chris, I need a guide. That, anytime you want. Um, <laughs> uh if I think about it, when I was on the agency side, that's yeah. what I would do is I wanted to educate people so they would be smarter to make better choices, either about what I was asking them to do or to do for themselves. So yes. maybe that's a better, more elegant way of saying it. Maybe we need to come up with like whatever the 16 or 14 things are yes. that your superpowers could fall into. That's I, probably a book. I think that could totally be a book. That's your next book, perhaps. I think I'm done the, writing um, books. The marketing, Chris Aaron's is everyone, the marketing shaman. There you go. Uh, no, no, I, I was at a <laughs> cocktail party uh, pre-pandemic, and I met a social media guru, ninja, um, like, and I like anytime anybody ever puts a profession and a yeah. moniker, you should run from that person. Who that, was the person? I no, it was like three different people. Four oh. different, like everybody had their own little like. Well, I'm a social media guru. I'm a social oh. media ninja. I'm a social media this. I'm like, oh, oh my god, I gotta run. <laughs> like, I don't want to be here. Like, <laughs> karate chop. Like that. that the, all of this says that you're not good at your job yes. because you, you had to name yourself. Like yeah, if somebody really thought you were good, they would call you that, but you would never call it. You can't give yourself a nickname <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. I think that's correct. Yeah. So I can call you yes. marketing shaman or a marketing guide, but yes. you can't call And I would yourself. resist it with all my fiber your of my being. Professor Aaron's. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I just haven't called me Chris, by the way. Chris, just Chris. Because it's an internship. Right. So the little things like language matter yes. in everything we do. So if I was their boss, they wouldn't call me Mr. Aaron's no, or, you know, CMO Aaron's or something like that. Chris. So. Just Chris. Just, just plain Chris. old Chris. Yeah. Okay. So Chris, you spent the first part of your career in agencies. Yes. Like myself. I think it's a great way to grow up. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'm curious if you can share with our listeners, how might you give people guidance around 
they've left your class, they're in their first seat at mm-hmm. a client side or agency, it doesn't really matter. Sure. How do you navigate the question of how do I know when to hire an agency? How do I know when to build something in house? Like what's, what's that landscape look like for you? Well, you ask good questions. Um, well, our, our amazing CMO, Elijah and CEO, Michael Robin, they switched the titles on me last week, by the way, Okay. they wrote the questions and our community team. Fantastic. They also contributed to the questions. So I just get to ask ask the questions, but credit, give credit where credit's due. Um, And you guys asked me about this, but I I don't know. I don't know if I have a great answer for it, but I think that, um, again, there's a lot of factors. If you're in an industry that has to move fast, you don't have time to build an in-house team. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, and, and (laughs) headcount. Yeah excuse me, getting headcount and everything else like that, that will take, you know, months and months and months in onboarding. And when I was at AMD, one of the first things they told me is that for the first six months on the job, you're going to be functionally useless. And I'm like, oh, come on. Like, I'm a rock star. You guys keep telling me I'm (laughs) awesome. There's no four or five months in. I'm like, you know, I was functionally useless for four or five months. I didn't go six, but I was still functionally useless. So I think that that's one of the things that you have to understand is that you can't just hire in expertise Mm -hmm. and have them understand your business. Now, agency people, because we're used to that and we have a diverse skill set and we may even have industry knowledge, Mm -hmm. we can do things that way. Also, I think, and you know, I'm an agency guy like you. um, I think there's tremendous value in getting a third perspective oh, like yeah. outside the walls. So then the question is, can you find the right agency partner, mm-hmm. which is sometimes tough, but I don't know that there's a magic flip the switch or if, you know, like a Cosmo quiz or GQ quiz, it says if, <laughs> if your brand has these seven things, you should get an agency or you should hire in house. I agree with you. I think if you're running controlled experiments and you're really intuitive and you figured out where your secret sauce lies, where you're deficient, where you're strong, Then you can pick and choose and say, you know, and this is what some of the biggest brands um, that are really successful do. Um, They will say, okay, well, we want to be here and we're doing pretty well here, but we're not doing great. So let's get an agency to augment our internal capabilities to make us really super in this area because now we have a great, strong internal team and a great agency team that's going to do something. Mm. And I think you've probably seen this. When the agency does too much, it doesn't always work because they don't have in-house license. And when the in-house team does too much, they get myopic and they seem to look at things the same every day. So Mm -hmm. I think, again, to your Sherpa guide analogy, I'm going to go back to that and say you probably need to be a little bit of a Magellan and constantly surveying the landscape and saying, where could we go that's going to be fruitful and how am I going to get there and what do I need to be successful once I get there? So your answer to when to insource, when to outsource is kind of the same as your answer about the best, most important marketing traits. Like be yeah. intellectually curious about that also. If you're the a CMO. changes over time because yeah. of a variety of things. If of you're a CMO things. or you want to be someday a CMO, yeah. you've got to be a, a navigator and a guide and you've got to plot your course knowing yes. that the course is going to change, the weather's going to change, yes. there's going to be roadblocks. Hopefully it'll be raining. Hopefully it'll we be love raining. rain. It's going to rain today, so that's It's going to rain today. Um, but yeah, I think that's what you have to do. And then in the book, one of the core principles of uh, the Digital Helix was, you know, you can't do one-year plans. You always have to be one step ahead. Yeah, so that's what's it. an ideal planning cycle then from your perspective? I think it's just kind of surveying the landscape and saying, okay, here's what we have to achieve. Here's where we have to go. Let's set up a yeah. test and measure campaign. Let's put the campaign into full implementation and then immediately say, what comes next? What is the follow-up to that? How are we going to hit the next wave, the next wave? So but we're it, always planning when we're on Chris's team. You're always doing it. because you And, and in the world we live in, which we just talked about, there's going to be so many things that change. You can't bake something anymore, yes. right? I mean, everything is an instant dessert at this point in time. <laughs> and it's probably something you're yeah. going to have to whip up with what is in the cabinet mm-hmm. or have somebody come over in an agency analogy. Yes. But yeah, there's... It's, it's crazy. I was thinking about this uh, last night because I, you know, I was thinking about this interview. Um, think about cell phones. We talked about cell phones earlier. Uh, I was thought of this. From 1990 to 2000, the phone went from basically a brick to a candy bar yeah. and not much else changed. Yeah. Okay. 2000 to 2007, BlackBerry, which you mentioned, and a couple little nuances, but it was pretty much the same. Nokia, Mo- Motorola dominated, right? 2007 iPhone comes out, 
things change pretty rapidly. Yes. Now in this world, you know, things are changing where we have full video, full audio. Now Three we're having lenses, lenses, AR, <laughs> yeah. artificial intelligence is going to be creeping more into the, like so much is changing so fast. The world is absolutely spinning faster and faster. And I think if you're doing anything in business, but especially marketing, you absolutely just have to be on your toes ready. And, um, I wasn't going to do this, but this is one of my favorite quotes. And I think this uh, illustrates it. Um, Mike Tyson, former Mm -hmm. heavyweight champion of the world, Mm -hmm. when he had won like several heavyweight fights, uh, a reporter asked him like, Mike, everybody's seen what you've done over these fights. They all have a game plan for you. What is your game plan against their game plan? And Mike (laughs) being Mike said, you know, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Mm. that's marketing. Yeah. You can have a plan until you get punched in the mouth and you're going to get punched in the mouth. So just be ready to take the punch Mm -hmm. and figure out how you're going to punch back. Yes. And, and maybe if you're a good marketer, punch above your weight. Yeah. That's what I think you have to have to think about in terms of planning and having a discipline or a mindset around it. Okay. So how can I run a series of controlled experiments that make my brand punch above its weight? Uh, I think it's, uh, well, I, I've, I'm going to steal Mike Cesario from Liquid Death. What is the craziest idea? What is the bravest thing we could do right yes. now? No idea is incredibly stupid. I've told my students, we were just talked about Liquid Death yesterday. Mm-hmm. There are some things that he's done that I don't feel comfortable talking about in the confines of the university system. Yeah. Like they're so out there that he I was that. Yeah. I just feel kind of, I mm-hmm. can't go there. Like I would feel squeamish. I feel like the, you know, the, <laughs> The moral police from UT <laughs> would come in and censor you, Mike. Yeah. And, yeah. but that's what he does is like, okay, let's put this out there. Mm. It is really a dumb fucking idea. Yeah. Let's see what but happens. If it works, mm-hmm. we know something. And yep. so it's not about wins and losses, it's about wins and lessons. Yeah. Can we? run these experiments and learn something so every experiment gets smarter and better. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to do. And you have to give your team about 20% of their time to basically think about these things. They're running nine to five or, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week at a hundred percent. They are never going to have those mental cycles Mm -hmm. to have true intellectual curiosity. So you have to say 20% of your time, and this is what Google and Amazon do is should be dedicated to coming up with something that's going to improve the state of our world, Mm -hmm. our marketing world. What are the crazy things? What are you going to read to get inspiration? What are you going to throw out there and figure out a way to experiment? And that's the way to do it, I think. I love that. Wins and lessons. Yes. Okay, last question. Yep. Who should we have join us on the show? Oh, my God. Um, You have, like, everybody I've mentioned so far, um, like the Wendy's team is... Mm-hmm. Godlike and Carl Laredo, their CMO is a McCombs graduate. Oh, he's, uh, I mean, what he's done at Wendy's is just phenomenal. And Jimmy Be- uh, Bennett, his VP of marketing, and mm-hmm. Kristen, they're phenomenal. Um, the woman who uh, is from Moody, uh, where you are from, uh, at uh, Chipotle, she is amazing. And what she's been able to do from Chipotle from the food scare to now is incredible. Um, you know, and I think. I, I just, there's so many people I like and I think are doing amazing things, but then I, I always really go back to Rory mm-hmm. Sutherland because I don't think there's any one person who's made me challenge the way I think and made me think that what I'm doing may not be optimal more than he's done. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's this crazy Brit, but... Um, he, and he's been on every podcast in the world. So that's, yeah. I, if you haven't seen Rory, you know, Get out from the rock and yeah, check it out. out. But I, I that's, love crazy Brits. I lived in London for three years. Oh, good. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I think that's the kind of people I like that when they speak, uh, and hopefully I've done just a, a tiny, tiny bit of this, is that holy shit, that's a good way of thinking. Holy shit, that's an interesting thing that yeah. I should bring into my data life or share with my team. So anybody who could do that, I think, is what I look yeah. for in a, a podcast guest or just yeah. a LinkedIn contributor, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, me too. That's my favorite kind of person to sit down with. It's like, whoa, you just blew my mind. Yeah. And, it, and sometimes it's think a sentence. completely differently. Yeah. Like like that don't do drugs pencils. Yes. Like it's so simple. It's like, yeah. holy crap, that is the analogy for everything yes. that people don't think next yeah. level thinking on. Like mm-hmm. and you know, I, I almost want to buy those pencils now and just give them out as kind of look, here's the two pencils. <laughs> this is this is yeah. <laughs> this is this is your marketing brain on drugs uh, yeah, right here, right? That's exactly right. Well thank you for being with me today. Oh this was a delight. I enjoyed it. Was it was so much fun. And I hope to hang out again soon. Whenever you want. I would enjoy it. Thank you. All right.